Anna Fisher, you were just 28 years old and only five or six years out of medical school when you were selected for astronaut training. What was it that drove you to apply for that job at that time of your life? Well, it was my dream job. It's what I always had wanted to do since I was 12 years old and listened to Alan Shepard's uh, suborbital flight. And um, it just seemed like a dream that wasn't going to be possible because there weren't a lot of women astronauts. Most of the astronauts at that time were test pilots. And um, I just thought it was an unrealistic dream. And when I suddenly found out that NASA was selecting um, scientists to be mission specialists, it was like my dream job. I didn't hesitate, I applied immediately, and I actually found out about it fairly late. I found out about a month before the deadline, so I barely got my application in because there was a lot of paperwork to fill out. So I uh, mailed my application, I guess, June 30th, and was interviewing the third week in August, so it all happened pretty quickly right. after that. And then your first flight came during this week of November in 1984. What's your favorite memory of your time in space? Oh, that's such a hard question to answer because there's just like so many favorite memories. Um, of course, it, that was a very um, difficult mission because it was something that the program hadn't, uh, that we were doing something very different for that early in the space shuttle program. So one of the happiest memories was that last day after we had the two satellites sitting in the payload bay looking, looking at them and thinking, gosh, did we really do all that? Because it was a lot of work. Um, um, a fair amount of risk, I mean risk of success, not so much of, of life. But it was um, a very exciting mission, so there's that. And then there's the, the launch, of course, was the most amazing part of, of, of a mission. And then the views out the window. Um, I remember looking at the snow-capped Himalayas as we launched with a full moon, under a full moon. And um, and then just the camaraderie with, the, with my crew, I launched with a um, it was like my family, almost my second family. So just that camaraderie um, at the end of the mission. So just lots of wonderful, warm memories. And with the team, um, Milt Heflin, who's um, uh, still here as well, was right. the lead flight director for our flight. So just that whole teamwork with the ground. Those are, you know, there's just so many memories I could go on and on, but those are a few of the highlights. We put together a few scenes of, of that mission, and I like to ask you to, to tell us what it is that we're seeing here and as you mentioned starting with the launch what is it like to ride that that rocket to space well um some people won't remember that they used to have e-tickets in disney disneyland but it was definitely an e-ticket ride um, um we launched actually on dale gardner's birthday we had a we, we scrubbed our first day because of the high altitude winds and i remember dale gardner telling the launch director that he promised not to blow out the candles <laughs> But it was a real exciting ride, and then... And the, to experience weightlessness for the first time? Oh, it was just amazing. You know, the first time you get up there, and in, in, in one second, you go from 3 Gs to 0 G to weightlessness, and the feeling is spectacular. I think you can see my necklace that I'm wearing here that I was wearing on board mm. um, that flight. Then we launched two communication satellites. This was the ANIC. Uh, satellite that I was the lead for, um, which we launched for the Canadian uh, government, and it's still up there functioning. And then the CINCOM, which was a communication satellite for the for the Navy, which Dale Gardner was the lead for, and I was the back bet. Now, uh, many people will remember as the exciting, the highlights of the mission is the fact that, well, I mean, of course, there was the the required grabbing candy. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite scene to show when I'm talking to kids. Mm -hmm. Of course, perhaps not so technical, but still a lot of fun. <laughs> but it makes the point. Uh, yes. Is the fact that you were going after a couple of satellites. Uh, tell us why, quickly, why did you have to go get these? Well, the two satellites were perfectly good satellites, but their um, Apache kick motors that were supposed to take them to geosynchronous orbit failed like four seconds into about a four minute burn. So the insurance companies were actually the big drivers to try to retrieve these satellites that were worth you know millions and millions of dollars. So uh, we devised a stinger-like device that you see Dale Gardner here flying up to the satellite um, that sticks into the aft end of the um, of the satellite because it was surrounded by solar arrays. So there was really no other place where you could. Uh, other than at the either end, touch mm -hmm. it without damaging the solar arrays. So here you see Dale docking with the satellite. And then um, 
eventually I went over and grabbed it with the arm. This is kind of an abbreviated uh, version. It doesn't oh, yeah. show all the details. But then we brought the satellite down into the payload bay and we had to attach another device because somehow we had to stick it, um, uh, attach it to the payload bay so that it would be brought back and not harmed and would not harm the shuttle as well. So here you see them working to put the um, berthing mechanism uh, to the bottom of the satellite. And then, like I said, there was that day where they were both in the bay and we could hardly believe it. Mm -hmm. And then here we we're landing at the, the Kennedy Space Center and it was just really um, a spectacular mission, uh, went almost flawlessly and then to be back home and get to see your family again was uh, a remarkable feeling. I do remember though that I felt like an 800 pound gorilla <laughs> at this point. I had some switches that I had to throw in the overhead compartment um, which in the simulator I could do in 30 seconds. It probably took me a couple of minutes because I actually felt like I had to lift my arm up to reach the switches. It but really is that dramatic as we oh, all I, heard. Like it, I definitely felt like an 800 pound gorilla. Uh, you had been assigned to a second flight, uh, but the loss of Challenger, which came after right. your flight, of course, changed everybody's plans. What was your uh, task? What jobs were you working on in those uh, those months after Challenger? Well, um, I, we would have been the flight right after Challengers. We were very close to being ready to go ourselves at that point. Um, I, I was actually the lead for our flight data file, and we used the, the two or two and a half years from the time Challenger flew to when we flew again, I mean, to when Challenger happened to when we flew again, to totally go through our entire flight data file. And we redid our procedures. We made sure everything was correct. And so that was the thing that I worked on uh, in the in-between time till we flew again. And Rick Houck, who was the commander of 51A, was also the commander of the return to flight STS-26. Now, when you returned to NASA in the mid-1990s after a leave of absence, your job in the astronaut office was more in the International Space Station program. Uh, explain what it was you were doing at that time. Well, when I, um, I, I should say, you know, I took a seven-year leave of absence. It wasn't really planned that way. It just wound up working out that way to stay home and raise my daughters and um, spend time with them. So when I came back in 1996, the office was very different. Um, when I left, nobody had computers. When I came back, everybody had their own computer. We weren't to laptops yet. but um, So it was a very different uh, environment, a very different way of doing business. But one of the things that was interesting was there was nobody left who really remembered what the shuttle program was like at the very beginning. And I think a lot of the astronaut office expectations of where the training should be, where the procedures should be, the level of maturity was a little unrealistic. And so I was able to point out that, um, you know, this is what it's like at the beginning of the program. Everything isn't perfect. So I was able to take that experience and be um, chief of the space station branch as we were developing the procedures, the training, and so forth for the International Space Station. And I consider that um, one of the most uh, enjoyable assignments I had uh, at NASA. And it's fun now to see the space station up there because we were just trying to figure out at that time how we were going to do it and how we were going to work with our Russian um, colleagues and our, the other international partners. So it was a really um, fun couple of years. And lately, you've been back working here in Mission Control as a, as a CAPCOM, as a spacecraft communicator, which is something that you did in the shuttle program as well. Yes, but it was really different. I was a CAPCOM for STS-8 and 9, um, which were shuttle flights. And, you know, that it's very different because for a shuttle, being a CAPCOM uh, for a shuttle mission, you had a defined team. And you all train together, you know, the ascent team, the orbit team, the entry teams. And so you all knew each other. You knew the crew. Here it's very different with 24-7 operations. Um, every position is manned in a, in a different manner. Um, but it's really fun to come back after having been at the beginning of the program and thinking how were we going to operate um, how, what kind of, were we going to have electronic procedures? I mean, in the shuttle, we had paper procedures, so it took a while to convince the first couple of crews that we were going to have to go to electronic. It just wasn't going to work um, since we could not keep up to date, keep books up to date that mm -hmm. much. So different things like that. And then the control center is entirely electronic now, so that's a big change from from the, the early shuttle program. So From shuttle to the space station, you're also today working on the next vehicle, on the, on the Orion spacecraft. Uh, tell me about your, your job there and what, what you're involved with. 
Yes, I'm working on the the displays for the Orion vehicle. Um, we have a rapid prototyping lab where we're um, coming up with our ideas of an electronic procedure viewer that interacts with the with the uh, Orion displays, and we've been doing evaluations to see how that works. And then we're also making um, that work and the the type of displays, um, the look and feel of the displays available to some of the commercial crew folks if they choose to to uh, want to use it. I personally believe that as we go into this new era of um, commercial crew plus the Orion vehicle, it would be really nice to have all the vehicles have sort of a common look and feel rather than each vehicle being totally different than the other one. So we'll see if we're successful about that. But um, this is my third big program, so it's really, I, I find it fascinating um, to be at the beginning of a program, like beginning of shuttle, beginning of station, and now the beginning of Orion and commercial crew, just to to think about how you're going to do it and then to see how it actually winds up turning out is, is um, extremely rewarding. Think about all of them for a second. If you think to the NASA of today and the one that was here when you arrived in 1978, um, how do you feel about the progress that this agency has made in that time? Well, it's, I mean, it's amazing the, the progress that was made with the shuttle program. I mean, when I first um, arrived here, you know, we were inventing the procedures, we were inventing the training, um, and then to see it become such a um, efficient training um, uh, organization and to see the shuttle flying so smoothly and pretty much on time, you know, with a couple of exceptions. That was definitely not the case in the early days. Um, but the the challenges um, that the agency faces, I think, are are kind of the same. All I mean, I, the thing I remember most at the beginning of the shuttle program is you're, you're constantly worried that it was going to be canceled because of lack of funding. And I see that same Sounds issue familiar. coming here right now. And, and I think that's just one of the, the um, you know, w when you're going to do space travel, it is expensive. And so it's always going to be competing with other um, things that they need to spend budget dollars on. So I think that's just always going to be the case. And I think that's one of the neat things about the international partnership, particularly if we go beyond low Earth orbit, um, trying to spread that cost. So in that sense, um, I really don't see a lot of change. <laughs> Anna Fisher, thank you for a few minutes and, and for the memories. It's, it's very interesting to hear about where we've come from. Well, we thank you so it. much. I really feel privileged. Astronaut Anna Fisher, a uh, veteran of shuttle mission STS-51A, which landed 28 years ago this week.